Okay, I'm back with the Tefeda and the Michigan on this uh, third installment of our JOE 2003 article review. And this one is on long-term outcome of endodontically treated traumatized immature upper incisors. So, uh, Mr. Michigan, go ahead. Okay, so this is a retrospective longitudinal cohort study performed by Van Gorp, and it's titled Long-Term Outcome of Endodontically Treated Traumatized Immature Upper Incisors. And in the study, 183 traumatized immature upper incisors were treated with pulpotomy, apexification, or a regenerative endodontic procedure. And they were assessed for presence of pulpal or periodontal response using standardized clinical and radiographic criteria. After a median follow-up of more than seven years, almost 87% of the teeth were still functional. And from these, 38.5% developed pulpal or periodontal tissue response which was significantly associated with the stage of root development at the time of trauma and the type of endodontic intervention. It was found that root development of less than three quarters at the time of trauma and regenerative treatment were associated with a poorer outcome. Tooth loss was significantly associated with the type and complexity of the traumatic event and the type of endodontic intervention. Apexification and pulpotomy showed a more favorable result than regeneration in terms of tooth loss. The authors of the study, they concluded that while many endodontically treated traumatized immature teeth could be kept functional, very immature teeth or teeth that have periodontal tissue damage and also those that were treated with regenerative um, treatment are at a higher risk for an unfavorable outcome. I'd like to ask you know, both of you, Drs. Fida and Nasa, if you can maybe share how or if the findings of this paper will influence your decision-making um, process for treating traumatized teeth with, you know, either apexification versus regenerative treatment. It's really interesting because it highlights that those treated with a pulpotomy um, actually were very successful and did well. So in an ideal world, you have a traumatized tooth, um, you know, specifically in the situation of a crown fracture, if there are some signs of a pulpitis, whether it's reversible or irreversible pulpitis, I think I would rather err on the side of doing a pulpotomy to remove that coronally inflamed pulpal tissue and allow the remaining radicular pulp to heal, um, since we know that pulpotomy and traumatized teeth has such a good success rate. And since we know that regenerative may have a less than favorable outcome in these traumatized teeth, you know, thinking about doing apexification where possible. However, sometimes it's just not possible knowing you know, how wide open that root structure might be. One thing that Tafita I was not quite fully um, um, understanding in this situation is that if the trauma occurs at the apex, since these kinds of traumas usually uh, are causing apical problems, why would a pulpotomy have a higher success rate? It's a great question. So this study in particular highlights that for crown fractures or less complicated injuries is where a pulpotomy can be more successful. And later on in the paper, it talks a little bit more about how if the injury is more complicated or more complex trauma, um, you know, a regenerative endodontic therapy or apexification is going to be required just because of the nature of the injury. But for these, you know, minor crown fractures, ideally the blow or that trauma is sustained in that coronal pulp tissue. And yes, we may be feeling some of that sensitivity throughout the apex because that's how our patients are going to register either percussion or palpation sensitivity by removing that coronally inflamed pulp, especially in a young patient who has a tremendous capacity to heal as we've talked about. Um, that pulp tissue does have the capacity to heal with the right material and you know, these teeth can be quite successful. So I mean, basically it goes back to what you said uh, earlier is that it's all to do with treatment planning. So yes. what is the etiology? What is the cause? If it is coming from, if it's a coronal type of damage, you know, normally it's caries, in this case, crown fractures, that would allow contamination and inflammation of the coronal pulp. That's why the pulpotomy would work. But if you have intrusive forces or other kinds of, you know, subluxation that would cause severance of the thing right at the apex, then it wouldn't work necessarily, mm -hmm. right? So I guess it goes back to what is causing the problem and how you can triage the case based on the mechanisms. You know, I've always found that if, like, if you just understand first principles of what you're doing and what are the concepts behind, what are the scientific concepts behind what you're doing, that it, you can always extrapolate the best treatment just based on that. It's like a lot of people just go back and say, what does the research show? And I'm like, a lot of this stuff is if you study, you know, your Chem 101, Chem 102, your biochem and your physics, a lot of this stuff is just, and biology obviously, it's like, 
it just all works together. It's like the same basis of medicine, histology, all that stuff comes back and becomes the first principles that guide your uh, your decision making. Oftentimes, we just rely so much on, on on research alone, and unfortunately, a lot of this research that we see sometimes the end number and the the, the power of the studies are not that great. The, the variability is so great. So that's why we keep going back and forth between the calcium hydroxide, triple antibiotic pace, you know, what's, you know, you would think that science would have one answer, right? And it's not just limited to endo, I feel it's just across the board in, in, in dentistry. And if anything, in medicine, right? The my studies that were done back in the 2000s by Dr. John Ioannidis, uh, who did the research in this area, were, found that there was a lot of um, problems with some, some of the research that, that we run. So, but of course, I mean, we have to run by what we have. Uh, but uh, you sometimes wish you could have a little bit more robust research, right? I mean, this is a great example of how dentistry really is a science, but also a little bit of an art. And so, especially working with a young pediatric population where the research, as you mentioned, may have um, sample sizes that are very small, mm -hmm. the follow-up may be very small, they may be retrospective projects rather than prospective. I'm taking everything I can from the literature and trying to apply basic principles that we know about immunology, about treatment, you know, uh, diagnosis, uh, treatment planning, treatment execution, and then extrapolating that to these patients because sometimes we don't have a research article to tell you exactly what to do with this one particular pediatric patient. Yeah, I always say we've got to always fall back on the first principles and that's the key things uh, because um, so much of what we have is uh, just not adequate. But before we finish, because I mean, that was a very great article, I think, but a uh, quick question. What do you think the AAE and the foundation should use this, the, the, you know, the, 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 the money that they have for? Do you think, I, I have this theory that the best way to manage the kinds of research that we need to, to do is for the foundation to hire, you know, non-commercial, you know, professional researchers, you know, people like yourselves, people that, that are at different academic institutions, that are well-known names, that are credible, to run proper perspective, you know, uh, um, case-controlled studies in the, 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 that can answer some of these questions, right? I mean, don't you think so? Compared I mean, that would be wonderful. But one limitation, I think, is also related to reimbursement. Um, so, so even here in Massachusetts, um, you know, Medicaid is not covering a lot of these services, and patients may not be able to pay for them out of pocket. So then, what do you do then? Unless we have funding that can right. help support. Um, treating these patients and then following them up. That's, that's what I think is the thing. That's, I mean, that's why I'm saying we're, we're doing JOE, Journal of Endodontics, that the AAE has a foundation sum, and that sum, in my opinion, instead of doing small little research pieces that are all usually proxies for that are either significant or non-significant, it'd be better to give like a big sum, lump sum to do a significant proper study by a professional researcher or in a group to to really find out some of these answers that you know we, we just don't have that would be great <laughs> that would be great good, right? yes terrific any other questions about this one or should we uh... um yeah I, mean, I have another question so you know patient education is a really important part of what we do to help our patients make informed decisions so in cases you know where you have a a young patient um, with trauma, how do you, do you present both apexification and regeneration as treatment options and how do you present that to the parents so that they can make a decision? It depends on the patient and the parent. You know, I think we've all experienced some patients where they need to know every little nitty gritty piece of information and then some patients they need big picture, you know, descriptions of what's going to happen. So I always engage the patient and the parent and ask them, how much of this do you need to know? How much of this do you want to know? But there's also the implication of insurance reimbursement and out-of-pocket costs, so we have to make sure that that is clear for the patient as well. Um, but you know, if a patient says to me, what would you do? We have a lot of literature to support both regeneration and both apexification in the immature necrotic tooth. So I think it probably also depends on your level as a practitioner, as an endodontist, what you feel more comfortable with and what works best in your hands as well. That's essentially what as being a good clinician, is having that foresight and understanding all of the factors involved and measure them and figure out what's really best for your patient. You know, that's really the measure of a good clinician. Well, I can't thank you guys enough for putting this together. It was terrific and I'm sure it was very uh, helpful to our uh, 
viewers as well. And hopefully we can do uh, more of these for you guys. And in the meantime, we're joined by Dr. Zamira Fida and Dr. Mona Meshkin, who uh, graciously spend their time going over these articles with me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great one.